All right, welcome to another meeting of the um, Committee on Corporations. We have in front of us um, Senator Kel Case Day. We have two, two bills from the good senator. I believe we'll start with Senate File 40, Federal Political Action Committees and Reports, and then we'll move to Senate File 43. But first, Barb, go ahead and call the roll. Representative Harrelson. Here. Representative Harshman. Excused. Excused. Vice Chairman Knapp. Here. Representative Newsom. Here. Representative Ottman. Here. Representative Wiley. Here. Representative Yen. Here. Chairman Olson. Here. Thank you. All right. Welcome, Senator Case. Senate File 40, Federal Political Action Committee Reports. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hello, committee. Nice to see you. Um, it's funny, except for Representative Yen, you're all brand new on this committee. So uh, this bill that's in front of us is actually kind of a product of the Interim Corporations Committee work. It was not an Interim Corporations Committee bill, but we did take it up at our last meeting, and we uh, agreed to bring it as a private bill. And uh, um, so... And what it is, Mr. Uh, Chairman, during the last election cycle, we learned of a kind of a loophole or anomaly in our reporting requirement uh, that had to do with respect to uh, a federal uh, political action committee. Um, so federal political action committees are not required to file reports in Wyoming. And it's always been assumed, well, that's because they're federal. They're supporting federal candidates federal issues, and so there's no need to make them file in Wyoming. But we had a particular uh, political action committee that regist registered in, in the federal realm, but uh, did activities in the state realm. So they supported local candidates, they advocated uh, down at the precinct level all the, way, all the way through statewide candidates. They didn't file any reports uh, for their state activities. And Wyoming's law is pretty tough on that. It, any person who joins with another person in any way that influences local elections, state elections, or ballot initiatives has to file a report. It, there's no getting around that. But this entity uh, filed as a federal PAC and uh, didn't file any state reports. It caused a little consternation, and it was finally the county clerk from the particular county that brought this to our attention. And so what this bill does, all it does, is to go back into that exception for federal uh, campaign reports and say, yes, this is true. You, you don't have to file in Wyoming, but only if you don't make any effort to involve a Wyoming election. So it's kind of torturous uh, language, I suppose. But the old language under 2225106G, it says candidates for federal office, campaign committees for candidates for federal office, and federal political action committees shall not be required to file contribution expenditure reports under this section if the candidate or their committee is required to comply with federal election law reporting requirements. What this does is put in the, the disclaimer that that's true as long as you are making expenditures only to federal candidates or federal issues. So that's the new language. And so it just reads candidates for federal office, campaign ca committees for candidates for federal office, and federal politi political action committees that are making contributions or expenditures only to federal candidates or for federal issues shall not be required to file. That's the gist of the bill. Um, we heard about this at our last meeting of the Corporations Committee, our last interim meeting here in Cheyenne. The committee was very favorably disposed, but we did not approve a bill in concept. We said we'd look at a draft and bring it as an individual bill. So I, I don't know how I missed Representative Yen, but I tried to get all the members that were still coming back to the legislature to be co-sponsors. I'm not sure, I, I'm sorry if I missed you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Committee questions? Mr. Chairman, for me. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, just a note on that. I was not at that meeting because I wasn't on the committee 
at that time. I, I only served for one year on the committee. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman, yes. thank you. Thank you. You you switched off with Representative Clifford. I remember now. That's why. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So you missed him, but you didn't. Well, he wasn't on the roster at the end. Uh, but I'm glad to see him back, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. It's good to have a little bit of institutional knowledge on this committee. Representative Haroldson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and <clears throat> Senator Case. So just help me get a 30,000 on this. The concept, obviously, of where we're not requiring federal to normally uh, register or to normally do the, um, like, distinguish their, con their contributors. Uh, obviously, when you get onto the federal level, there's, this is a First Amendment right to protect these individuals and, and, and their contribution as, as basically a way of political free speech. I know that's that conversation that, that has gone out there across the board around a lot of states. Mm -hmm. um, so in this case, we're, we're now making kind of a carve out where if, if they're federally based, but yet if they dabble in state politics, now all of a sudden they have to, uh, they have to show that list of contributors and they have to go through that process. Um, is there any concern about what that could breach uh, for them being obviously on the federal level as well on a state level and if that's at all stepping on people's privacy and also that that a First Amendment. Could you just speak to that aspect, please? Mr. Chairman. Senator Case. Uh, I certainly do my best. Um, I think actually the federal requirements, uh, there's not necessarily a difference between the stringency of the requirements. And they both uh, relate to reporting expenditures and contributions. Um, I'm not an expert on the federal requirements. This is not meant to uh, ensnare, ensnare any federal pact to make them provide more information in Wyoming unless they're actually doing Wyoming uh, lobbying work. So that's the only time that they would come in. Um, it, the, the practical reasons are that, you know, you may not agree with uh, contribution limits or reporting and all these things. That's, that's one thing. But in Wyoming, everybody's got to do it except for individuals. Individuals are the only ones that don't have to file a report. Um, so this, it's kind of a fairness thing. And at first, when this was brought to the attention of uh, the Secretary of State's office and the county clerk, they thought that, well, we can just go look at the federal reports and that'll provide the information that we need. This, this entity had not, was delinquent on its federal filings. So they were not of use to Wyoming in a timely manner. And even if they were current in their federal filings and they had identified the expenditures in Wyoming, the, uh, the timeline for reporting those federal filing, filings doesn't match up with what we have. You know, we have the, is it 10 days before the election or seven days before the election, current to 10 days before the election. And we have those reporting timelines which don't jive with the federal guidelines at all. So uh, really, uh, to be very truthful, it's apparent that this was viewed as a loophole by the, the entity uh, having the PAC and doing the election influ influencing in, and they pretty much got away with it. Um, and this would close that loophole. Representative Harrelson, follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So one more question. Thank you for sure. that. One more question. Um, other states doing this, is this kind of, is this pretty much across the board what other states do and we just don't, or, uh, or what are we seeing on other states and how they handle this? Mr. Chairman, I do not know what other states' policy is. In Wyoming, we have a requirement that everybody has to report except for individuals. Um, and so every, even if we all got together and did a newspaper ad, and we didn't have an official PAC, we, we would be required to report under Wyoming law, right or wrong. So this conforms to Wyoming law. I'm afraid I don't know uh, how it connects to state, other states. Representative Ottman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Senator Case, um, just a question for in my mind because apparently um, you guys have looked at this for a long time. So is this only one entity that we have found that is kind of kind of breaking our law? Are they breaking our law? Is there more people 
are more organizations that we need to look at? Um, would this stop that? Or what, what is the impetus for, for bringing this? Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Senator Case. The, the impetus is that we had a organized effort to influence elections in Wyoming, and they escaped reporting in Wyoming, contrary to the law in Wyoming for any other entity. And they did it by representing themselves as a federal PAC, and they didn't, uh, by doing so, they escaped reporting so that if you have to file, uh, Mr. Chairman, you and your committee each have to file your receipts and expenditure chart. If someone formed a political action community to support you, they would have to file their receipts and expenditures. This entity participated in a Wyoming election quite extensively and did not disclose receipts or expenditures. So that is definitely, uh, it would be a violation under normal. There's another piece of our law that says any, any entity that works to influence an election must file reports. But this is an exception. And it's 2225106G says, hey, a federal PAC or federal candidates don't have to file in, in Wyoming. Now, you would think there would be some logic involved that if they worked the ele Wyoming election, not a federal election, they should have to be required to report, but nobody's been able to pin them down on that. And this is what's going to pin them down. So I don't know if there are others. You'd have to go to the list of extensive federal PACs, then try to figure out what they spent it for and hope that they made their federal disclosures appropriately, then you'd have to back in and see if any of those expenditures were for local Wyoming candidates. It might be a big undertaking, it might not, but we proved this one and we can fix it with a simple exception because the fact that it's known now, it's a known hole in our law, I mean, it'll be used by others. Okay. Mr. Chairman, Senator Case, just bear with me, I'm trying to um, to wrap around it. So basically, they can, uh, with this, if this goes through, they can do the action that they're doing, but they have to report. Yes, Mr. Chairman, exactly. Thank you. Representative Newsom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm assuming there's a penalty. I didn't look at the whole statute, but do you know what the penalty is if they don't comply? I don't off the top of my head. They're in that same section. There are, there are penalties. The same as not reporting your other, like if you received money and didn't report it. I don't think we've assessed a lot of penalties in Wyoming, and we're not heavy-handed. I would It would be my impression. Yeah, and um, I think there's, a, if I remember right, there's a general statute in the election code that says any violation of election code is a misdemeanor six months up to six months or a thousand dollar fine mm -hmm. i think that's the one that applies here unless there's something specific under 22 25 well, i don't know where it would be actually but i'm not 107 what is and is it a misdemeanor uh failure to file a report within the time required will be subject to the following civil penalties 500 dollars per day um beginning on the date of the final order and two hundred dollars to file failure to file a report with the county clerk. Oh, so it's just a civil penalty. I believe so. Okay. Additional questions, committee. All right. Thank you, Senator Case. Would you like me to step back, Mr. Chairman? Yeah. Okay. We'll bring you back up if we need you again. Otherwise, we'll take public comment. Public comment. We. We have some folks signed up online, but they're for a different bill. Do we have anyone raising their hands? No. Yep. Ms. Herman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee. Mark Reed Herman with the League of Women Voters, um, and I'll just say that I've been watching the legislature for 40 plus years, and I think we find, we've got some good statutes here. I've heard many debates about the value of um, understanding where and how much money is spent in the state to influence 
campaign issues, um, from ballot issues to candidates. Um, and I think we know that that's important in, in statutes, and I think this simply um, covers one thing that um, is, um, maybe happened before, but now it's come to our attention, um, agreeing with Senator Case, that um, it's a pretty um, straightforward fix, so I would encourage you to vote for the bill. Ms. Herman, does the is, so does the league support this bill? Yes, sir. Perfect. Thank you. Additional public comment. Gail. Gail Simmons, Civics 307. Uh, Chairman, uh, as to the question that uh, Representative uh, Haroldson asked around the First Amendment rights, I think that's kind of conflating the Citizens United, uh, which has to do with a different type, like a like a super PAC, where they're allowed to, to keep that um, uh, from being disclosed. When in fact, uh, as was pointed out, this is simply providing at the same level every single expenditure in support of of um of election of, of trying to influence elections which is not a bad thing i mean that's that's what people campaign for is to um influence elections but but to as as was pointed out that that loophole that was in there now my own cognitive bias i just want to be really clear is that that i was working again this time non uh, a, as a partisan i actually in two different campaigns or two different election seasons uh the first time i paid for myself uh a a, a series of cards that was sent out encouraging people to vote for uh precinct people that mostly came because the undervotes for campaign for precinct people is horrendous um it's getting better but it's horrendous so i paid for that myself and i put down paid for by gail simmons this time i did the same thing and i had actually um designed made the arrangement said paid for by gail simmons and i actually had some of the precinct people contact me and say we'd actually like to help uh, and so I said, okay, if you want to, I'm going to do it whether you you provide uh, help to me or not. And I found out after a complaint was filed that I actually should have created a PAC at that time. Uh, but when I found out that, in fact, it applies at a county level as well as a state level, which I was very aware of, I actually quickly created a PAC and submitted those uh, expenditures receipts and expenditures uh, within the time frame. So even when it's as, as low as I think it was $3,000 altogether, I think I paid 2,000 of it. Um, you know, it's, it's really about, uh, as was said, evening the, the, the playing field. So whether it's at the county level, the state level, uh, everybody who influences a uh, local county or statewide election, should be providing the same uh, same reporting, even when they mess it up and have to fix it later. <laughs> and I stand for questions. Questions for Ms. Simmons. All right. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that with us. We appreciate it. Additional public testimony. Seeing no public testimony, I will close public testimony on Senate File 40. Committee, what is your pleasure? Moved by Representative Chadwick, seconded by Representative Wiley. Do we have any amendments to this bill on page one? Amendments to page two. Any other discussion on the bill? Question on the bill? Barb, will you please do a roll call vote on Senate File 40 Federal Political Action Committee reports? I will. Represent Representative Chadwick. Representative Haroldson. No. Vice Chairman Knapp. No. Representative Harshman, aye by absentee. Representative Newsom. Aye. Representative Ottman. Representative Wiley. Aye. Representative Yin. Aye. Chairman Olson. Aye. Six aye. Three, no. 
do pass. All right, thank you, Barb. Next bill for our consideration is Senate File 43, EMS Districts. Also, Senator Case, welcome back. Appreciate the tie that you chose to wear for this meeting. It's a very, it's very appropriate for a corporations meeting. Mr. Chairman, they're all my dad's ties. Ah, they're all short. So, but anyway, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senate File Forty Three allows for the creation of an EMS district by a board of county commissioners. It basically goes to the uh, into the statutes regarding uh, improvement districts and. <laughs> Uh, the improvement district statute have various purpose, one of which is EMS services. And so you can form an improvement uh, district to provide EMS services, but it requires that you have an independent board. It requires that there be a board that's, that's elected by the people as a whole. This bill carves out an exceptional uh, procedure that allows the board of commissioners to achieve the same ends by appointing their own board. And it's not without precedent. This is essentially the way that um, uh, solid waste districts are formed. The uh, solid waste district folks are, the board members are appointed by the Board of County Commissioners and, uh, and then the, the levies for the solid waste district are required to be acted on by the voters. That's exactly the model that's in here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you might ask, why would we want to do that um, and I would submit to you that it's um, a lot less cumbersome. And I had the opportunity uh, a few years ago, I served as chairman of the, um, the, the Select ta uh, Task Force on Special Districts. And I served two years as that chairman. It was a, a project between um, our industries and legislators and special district members. And I came away with the conclusion that special districts are kind of an unwieldy uh, thing and that the most well run, the most fiscally responsible are the ones that are closer tied to the county governments. And so this uh, follows that model. So the county commissioners can create the district and they can appoint the board, they can dissolve the district, they can do everything, uh, but they cannot levy taxes. And so the, it takes a vote of the people to levy the taxes for the district. Why would we want to do that? So I don't know how everyone here, um, what their exp experience in their home counties with respect to EMS services, but it's a challenge in Wyoming. I think Fremont County, uh, along with other rural counties, might be a bit of a poster child. We're trying to provide EMS services. You know, we're very vast. Um, the budget is, we've tried doing it with volunteers years ago. Um, the volunteer EMS district didn't work. People demand a higher level of services. They demand more professionalism. They demand faster response times, and they uh, de demand more capabilities from the district. So it looks like the volunteer model has kind of gone by the wayside in my county. It's still used in a couple of counties around the state. You guys, some of you might be experienced with that. Sometimes it works really well. It doesn't work well in Fremont County, partly because you can always get folks to provide services in a certain area, but to, to achieve service in a whole county is difficult. And, uh, you know, you can imagine a lot of our rural areas that where we have industrial facilities, on and on and on. Fremont County is a little bit unique in another reason, Mr. Chairman. We have private hospitals, and there's a new public hospital coming up in Riverton, but in a lot of counties, the hospital is very connected to providing ambulance services. That's not true in Fremont County. It's a private company, and you, um, you know, they participate um, kind of organizational-wise, but they don't provide ambulance services. So we've had to hire ambulances. Uh, we've gone through more than one contractor, and it's come down to where uh, it's a difficult service to support. This gives us a tool. Um, I think it's a tool that would be useful in a lot of rural counties. One more aspect about Fremont County and maybe other counties, Mr. Chairman, is you're gonna be transported no matter what. Chances are you're not gonna be staying. If, if, if you're 
if your situation is severe, they will be removing you either by life flight or by ground transport to another hospital somewhere else. It's the way that it goes. Unfortunately, it also happens if the hospital has, you know, they can, they can deal with a broken leg, right? Or they can deal with a heart attack typically. But what happens is you get to the hospital and there's a shortage of coverage. So they can't even admit you. So then you get retransported somewhere else. And it happens a lot, unfortunately. I think that's some of the complaints that uh, Representative Ottman might know about why uh, the Riverton folks decide to go their own way. This, this would definitely provide that. And if you go in, Mr. Chairman, the structure of the bill is it simply follows the service and improvement district deal and creates um, an exception. And so a lot of this is just uh, uh, exception language. So 1812-105 on page two, this is how you create a district. And this is the first paragraph, uh, how you form a, a district by filing a petition addressed to the commissioners. Except for the new red language allows for an alternative means of forming the district um, uh, to provide med emergency medical services is formed pursuant to subsection B. And if you look at subsection B, Mr. Chairman, line 18, this is after the 1st of July this year, you can have an alternative where you, the county commissioners themselves by resolution establish the district um, and they can establish one or more districts to provide EMT services composed of any portions of the county. They may add or subtract areas to the, to the proposed area. Um, within 60 days, the, they shall hold a public hearing and publish the proposed resolution, including the date and time of the public hearing in a newspaper of general circulation of the county and on the county's website. The Board of County Commissioners shall submit the proposed boundaries of the district to the county assessor and the Department of Re Revenue for review of any conflict, overlap, gap, or other boundary issue. The assessor and the department may make written comments thereon to the county commissioners before the public hearing, and the Board of County Commission may dissolve the district established under this section, subsection of the courts WS 183-525. This 1812-113 talks about the, the Board of Directors, and again, it just carves out the exception at the, uh, at the top of the language, except for districts to provide EMS established under the county appointment procedure. Um, Similarly, on line 16, uh, this is how you increase or decrease the number of members. Again, you carve out the exception uh, uh, that allows the county commissioners to do that. Um, and it's all, this all the exceptions on page five, lines eight through 15. After Jan July 1st, 2023, if a district to provide emergency medical services established under WS 1812-105B, that's this, that's what we're creating. The Board of County Commissioners shall appoint not less than three, no more than nine residents of the district to constitute the Board of Directors of the district. Appointees shall serve a term of three years and may be reappointed. Terms of office shall be staggered. So that's a lot how a solid waste district is established by the board. It kind of follows that same model. Um, and then the, the tax piece is a little torturous here because it amending language, but the gist of all this is that the district can assess up to four mills, but it has to be put to the voters for approval. Can't do it without the voters, Mr. Chairman. Um, so you can just see the bottom of page, uh, towards the bottom of page six lines 13 through 18. If the district performed under WS 1812-105B as a district to provide EMS services, the tax for the district shall not exceed four mills if the mills are approved by the board of directors and approved by the electors as provided in subsection C. The electors are the voters, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, that's the bill in a nutshell. And uh, I think it's not going to be used by every county. And I realize that some counties have um, like a major hospital that provides service and that the geographic area of the county may be smaller and this just doesn't make any sense at all. But that's, that's certainly okay. For areas perhaps in the Bighorn Basin, 
Sweetwater County, Carbon County, I can see this as being a really good tool for them to deal with the increasing challenges of providing EMS services. Thank you, sir. What's the magic behind capping it at four mills? Why four mills? Oh, Mr. Chairman, um, I can't remember exactly where the four mills came from, but if you recall, um, counties themselves are limited to 12 mills. That's the, 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 uh, uh, the constitutional limit on counties. Cities are limited to eight. Um, four seems generous to me, and uh, I guess we'll see what the voters would approve. I'm, I'm more inclined to think four is on the high side than it is on the low side. But we can figure out what that means. Mm -hmm. We actually have a county commissioner, I think, online who's going to testify. He might be able to explain that. Okay. Additional questions for Senator Case? Representative Chabuk? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Case, uh, as I recall, or from what I'm reading here, it, it shows not to exceed four mils. So uh, the newly appointed board uh, or elected board as it as time goes on can set that at one or two and as I have uh, as I have witnessed uh, these mill levies it's generally they're generally sought uh, at a level which will support the activity that you're trying to support uh, you know that's what I've seen so four I agree may be too too high but I it, I expect that if they set it too much too high, they won't be on the board anymore. Just a comment. And Mr. Chairman, case. I think that's a really good observation. You did mention that they would be appointed and later elected. These guys will always be appointed by the county commissioners um, under this form. And the, because the board is created by the county commissioners and their budget goes through the county commission, not all special districts budgets go through, but this budget will go, will have, uh, they'll be submitting their budget to the county commissioners. So I think that tightens up the frugality of this, I guess, makes, and, and I, I agree with you completely that they don't need to apply for four. They can submit to the voters one or two or, you know, and the voters will have a handle in deciding this. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I guess my only point would be two years that maybe if four is excessive, then why why give them the statutory authority to go that high? Well, and Mr. Chairman, I I think we better hear, hear, from, uh, yeah, hear a little hear bit from, more about that, sure. you know. Okay. Um, it's kind of become an important service, believe it or not, especially as your local medical facilities are do less overall in rural areas. I mean, they're, they become more of a, you used to go to the hospital no matter what, and you were there till you got well or died, you know? And now transport, most patients are transported and anything that's difficult is transported. So it's kind of changed the dynamics of how this all works. I know there are lots of people that want to testify too. Sure. Representative Ottman. Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Case, I have a lot of questions uh, just to verify it because I do know that it's a it's a big problem where we are. Um, but um, some of them I can wait till the commissioners are on like fiscal how much. But what I was wondering was in this situation that we're in and we're looking throughout the state for answers, there's been a couple ideas about um, developing larger groups that may provide services and everything would this enable would this board still look for a private entity would they i mean a large majority of the people that were having the problems um financially supporting this and the county commission is uh, having fiscal problems is people that um, aren't people that will pay the mills that are property owners. So is there, is there hope that this will um, pay for itself? I mean, with the mills, is, is that a 
possibility. And then also I was wondering with um, the rural people, there's more um, property ownership, larger parcels. So, and also the need for transport more than, um, we've had a couple mayors uh, not on board. So what are your thoughts with that and how this might work? Senator Case. Mr. Chairman and Representative Ottman, I'll, I'll do the very best I can. Um, if we look at ambulance service in Fremont County right now, it's evolved from being 100% government supported but volunteer organization where the governor, the government owned the ambulances and the equipment and was largely staffed by volunteers. It moved to a, a model where they hired contractors to, to provide ambulance service, but they still own the equipment. This doesn't restrict any kind of provisioning. It could be provided as a government department, I suppose. It, you could still use the volunteer model to supplement if that worked for your county, or you could do it wholly as a private entity. It doesn't restrict that. It also doesn't restrict the fees. This provides taxpayer mill levy to support it, <clears throat> But our ambulance service charges fees for transport, um, you know, um, and I'm, it will not eliminate in and of itself fees to be charged. I mean, it'll, all, it'll have to have a model of working that makes sense. And it's probably gonna be a combination of tax revenues, transport fees, other grants, and it'll be a mixed bag. But it, this doesn't restrict that. With regards, Mr. Chairman, to cooperating with other entities, it also doesn't restrict that. It, it kind of restricts the boundaries of the districts for tax purposes, but the organization with respect to how the service is performed and whether they partner with another county or another entity in another county, that could still happen. For example, if in, in, in our neck of the woods, uh, um, in Dubois, that's in your district, people are transported to Dubois. Sometimes, sometimes they're transported back towards Lander or Riverton, and sometimes they're transported out of the county to Teton County. We don't want that to change. It's, it's the circumstances and whatever is the best to happen. We don't want to restrict operations to just be with one entity within one county. We need to, we need to have that cooperation for it to work. I hope that's helpful. All right, Senator Case, let's get some. Oh, go ahead, Representative Newsom. So I, um, I'm not quite understanding what this money does. Mm -hmm. So if there's an ambulance call, I, I guess the question is, there are ambulance services that don't have enough business to maintain being an ambulance service. Is that correct? And then this money would go towards supplementing their ability to stay open. Or how, so if I take an ambulance ride into Cody. I bet you don't know anything about that. I don't know anything about <laughs> ambulance rides. But if, if I were to take that ride, mm -hmm. my share or my insurance company's share of that particular charge would not be diminished by virtue of this EMS district. I'm trying to sort of figure out how, as a consumer, it's to my advantage to pay an extra four mils to have an EMS district, mm -hmm. or is it good to the order? Or I mean, I'm trying to figure that out. So, so Mr. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and Representative Newsom. Well, right now the fees in Fremont County—I don't know about your county—but they don't cover the cost of the ambulance service. It's a big budget item for our county commissioners, and it's been one that we've had trouble attracting contractors. They just say, it's, it's, you know, you're not paying us enough. Fremont County is big. We also have um, a lot of poverty. And there are a lot of these fees that are uncollectible. We, you know, the state could organize a little bit better maybe to make sure that we pooled all the insurance fees and we surcharged everybody's bills so that we could do this somehow through the insurance mechanism or the cohesion of government to make sure it's paid for. But I think in the end, we're gonna have a combination of fees 
and uh, government support for these services. That's certainly the way that it's evolved in Fremont County. And they are very expensive, as I think, as you know, we had a bill um, passed a couple of years ago about the life flight portion of these fees, remember, and whether you could have by insurance, which wasn't really insurance, you bought a membership in the ambulances. We said you couldn't buy memberships, and then we came back and a couple of years later said you could buy memberships. So we have struggled with how to handle the private fees, the charges. Um, the insurance companies have also struggled. Everybody struggled, but we do know that the fees um, are supplemental, but they're not necessarily fair, and they don't handle the indigent care, and they don't cover all the costs. And I think um, I know that Commissioner Mike Jones is going to be on from Fremont County, and he might be able to give you a flavor of how much are covered by fees and how much are covered by the county's budget. But it's significant. Thank you. All right, let's get some of that public testimony then. I'll step back. County commissioners? You've been referenced a few times. Sounds seems appropriate to go to you next. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Jeremiah Riemann here on behalf of the Wyoming County Commissioners Association. I'm actually joined by three county commissioners uh, today. To my right, we have uh, Mr. Lee Livingston from Park County. And online, we have uh, commissioners uh, Larry Allen and Mike Jones from Fremont County, who will be able to provide some greater context. I'll try and hit some of the points that have been uh, discussed in the conversation here. Uh, but I'll start by saying uh, counties in the broadest sense, and that includes municipalities and others uh, that uh, are, are focused on this particular issue, have been trying desperately to uh, ensure that this essential service is provided uh, within the community. But we're struggling on a number of different fronts, whether that's just service, whether it's uh, ensuring that there's staffing uh, available for these, uh, ambulance uh, services or other emergency services, it's not an easy thing. And I think we all have that expectation that when we pick up the phone and call for an ambulance that it's going to come. And unfortunately, we probably shouldn't have that uh, a complete expectation in our current uh, situation. So we're trying to find uh, answers. Um, uh, the governor's uh, healthcare task force uh, began work uh, in the last uh, 18 or so months and quickly determined that they needed to have a focus group on this EMS issue. There have been some that have suggested that we should just call EMS a, uh, an essential service and that will fix things. Unfortunately, uh, just calling it an essential service doesn't mean that it's going to get funded in budgets that are already uh, at their maximum. In fact, 20 of our 23 counties already assess the full complement of their mills, so don't really have additional room to uh, fill this service. Uh, and second, uh, you know, that we have right now county general funds and other general funds of, of local governments that are trying to address this. We have special districts, uh, but we need another tool in our toolbox uh, the good senator talked about uh, these commission-appointed boards. I'll just point out one other thing that helps to ensure that they are successful and, and, and well-run is that the county commissioners have line of veto authority over those budgets. That's a particular part of our special district statutes with these particular boards. I've heard a little bit of conversation about mills, four mills versus something else. Uh, and I don't know what the magic number is here, but I'll just provide some context uh, for you in terms of what is the value of a mill uh, in our various counties. We have eight counties right now that can generate less than $300,000 on one mill. Those are your hardship counties. So when you're talking about direct distribution, they're given uh, an additional consideration under that. Three of those counties, uh, can generate less than $180,000 on one mill. 
So uh, if I just take Washakie County as one of those examples, four mills in Washakie County raises slightly more than one mill in Sheridan County. So four mills means a lot to some of our rural counties out there. And, and so perhaps we should uh, uh, at least think to keeping uh, that particular uh, concept in place, understanding that some counties are going to have to budget differently and won't need that full complement uh, of mills. And I'm happy to give you your own county's number if I have it uh, available to me. But I just wanted to make sure that I gave you that context. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'd stand for any questions, uh, but I do believe at least the two Fremont County Commissioners have uh, great uh, background and, and uh, testimony to provide you on this issue. Committee questions? Yes, Representative Haroldson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, real quick question. We, we've heard a 12 mil cap and an eight mil cap, eight for municipalities and 12 for counties. And you said 20 of 23 have already hit their cap. So is their cap currently set at eight mil and we would be bringing it to 12 or is it at 12 or bringing it to 16? Or am I misunderstanding how the, the mill cap works? I might be. The second question is on page five, eight through 15, where it actually establishes uh, this board being county commissioner uh, oversight and selection instead of voter uh, selection. Can we talk about kind of maybe what that looks like and why that would be? So Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Haroldson, as it relates to the county cap, the 12 mills, that's constitutionally set. So we can't go above that. Uh, what I was tra trying to convey uh, in providing that information is that those counties are already at, uh, those 20 counties are already at their mill levy, so they really don't have additional budgetary space beyond what they're already allocating for emergency medical services uh, in the current environment. Uh, there are those three that could go up. Uh, those three are Fremont, uh, Teton, and Campbell counties. Campbell, Campbell County is right near the 12 mill levy. Uh, Teton County is considerably below I seven point something off the top of my head and Fremont County's uh, at 10. So I'm just trying to convey what their budgetary constraints are with that. This bill would not provide them any additional mills. In order to do that, we would have to have a constitutional amendment. This is just another mechanism of setting up a district that would then allow for the collection of four mills, um, assuming that that's what was assessed uh, by that uh, particular district. Uh, in relationship uh, to your other question, there are really kind of two models that you can go after here when setting up these districts. One of them is to make those voter selected individuals that uh, uh, would fill those board seats. We have that model right now with our improvement and service districts. This is just another model that allows more control from the county commissioners to identify those individuals, appoint them, and then, as I said, have more oversight. Uh, the good senator pointed out some of those places where there's that oversight. I, I added that uh, the commissioners would then have line item veto authority, which commissioners don't have that authority over improvement in service districts or other special districts. Follow up. Representative Harrells. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, just thank you for that uh, information. I appreciate that. I guess the, the other question though, I guess now that you've mentioned that, 20 of 23 are at their max, really 21 of 23 are all, I mean, one's right on the bubble. So that means two counties could take and use this unless they restructured their, their tax structure. Is that correct? Director. Mr. Chairman, Representative Hellison, this option would be available to all of the counties. Uh, I, I'm, you know, if you're talking about the county mill, that is one option to fund these EMS districts. There are municipalities that are in place. There are other special districts. There are, of course, the fees that have been discussed. Um, so this would be a tool for all of them. But again, I don't believe all of them are going to take advantage of it because some of them have fairly well-functioning uh, uh, services currently, others are strained uh, and might look at this as an option to be able to provide better service. Follow up. 
Any other questions? Representative Ottman. Mr. Chairman, Jeremiah, hi. Um, so talking about mills again, and this isn't my expertise, but talking about them again. So if 12 is the max, is that the max for the county and then special districts can um, and municipalities can um, have additional mills on top of that? Is that what we're looking at? Director. Mr. Chairman, Representative Ottman, uh, yes. So the counties are capped at 12 mills. The municipalities are capped at eight mills. Uh, then you have a variety of different uh, special districts uh, that could be assessing mills within your area. Uh, and then the max or, or the, 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 the largest portion of the mill levy is your schools. 72% uh, of the entire mill levy is uh, dedicated to schools. Currently, the uh, total county uh, mill levy average across the state is 68 mills total. Uh, or about 6.8% of the value of uh, the property that's being assessed. Thank you. Representative Newsom. Um, so thank you and thank you for being here. Um, I guess I'm wondering about hospital districts. I know we have a hospital district in Cody. I think they have one in Powell and um, how this fits in with hospital districts and and if and what the cap is on hospital districts from a mill standpoint, if you know that. Director. Mr. Chairman, Representative Newsom, I don't know uh, what their mill levy is off the top of my head. I certainly can get it to you. We have some representatives here from the hospitals. Maybe they know it uh, uh, by heart. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> And they may be able to answer broadly the, the question that you're answering, but it is my understanding that those hospital districts could operate in this space, uh, but those districts are not always uh, countywide or, or in the service area that this might target. Representative Ottman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Jeremiah, just another question. So with this bill, seeing as some districts, some counties, may use it, some counties may not, some um, may be towards their maximum, although I don't, I still don't quite get how it's a maximum of 12 if they can continue to do other ones. But is this, is this necessary for it to be a state statute bill or could this be something that the counties decide to do themselves? Do they have to statutorily come before the state to set up a special district? Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Ottman, I apologize if I've confused you all with uh, reference to the county mill levy. What I was trying to convey with that is, is to share with you the compression that exists with the existing 12 mill uh, limit that exists there. Uh, your county, uh, as one, uh, does as I understand, and the commissioners will be able to articulate this better than I, currently allocate some of their general fund towards uh, EMS services uh, in their area. Uh, but as I think you'll hear them express, that isn't sufficient to provide the services that are needed uh, in your community to, or to ensure that we can find a contractor to provide those services. So as a general rule, the legislature has often granted these abilities uh, to establish special districts in a variety of different forms in order to provide some of the uh, services that the constituents in an area might demand. And this is one example of that. Let's go ahead and let the other two commissioners in since it sounds like, based on some of the questioning, it sounds like they'll be, they're, they're primed to answer some of our questions and articulate some of these matters a little better. So we have, we have Commissioner Allen and Commissioner Jones, I think. Okay, Commissioner Jones, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yep, go ahead and introduce yourself. And then if you have any remarks that you wanna share with us, go ahead. And then it sounds like we might have some questions for you. 
Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, committee, uh, my name is Michael Jones. I'm a Fremont County Commissioner. I live in Lander. Um, <clears throat> we've been working on this uh, for a long time, and and uh, Commissioner Allen can sure speak to some of the history and, and where we ended up here. Um, over the last couple of years, as we talked about looking for other options to fund ambulance uh, rather than using our our general fund. Um, we had looked at medical districts, we had looked at rural health districts, and none of those perfectly fit uh, what, what we were trying to do, and they were a little bit more cumbersome. This uh, legislation is, is designed to be more like that solid waste district, as Senator Case mentioned, and, and it certainly uh, provides us with what we consider an option an option to go to the voters, say, here we have something, this can fund it without decreasing the uh, other amount of services that we already provide to you under that 12 mil, uh, and, it, and it is an option. So like in the case of our solid waste district, that's a three mil um, levy, and it, uh, and it, it feeds the, the district uh, perfectly well. They're also able to raise funds under that. So it's, very, it's kind of a similar model. Um, just a little bit of history, Fremont County operated their own uh, EMS district up until 2016. Um, it was about a $3 million operation, and we were still subsidizing it at the tune of about $650,000 extra because the amount of reimbursements that come in, so you're an ambulance is sent for you, you're sent a bill. If you don't pay all that bill, uh, then then the county ends up covering that. Uh, the, the, the gap there between what, what we're, we, we were billing and what we get. So um, as that has evolved over time, we have um, we moved to a contracted model. And we've gone through uh, two different contractors and this current one now, when we started with them in 2020 uh, or 2021, the subsidy that we paid to have them do the, to operate the service was $950,000. Uh, currently that, that subsidy is $1.45 million. Uh, so it's becoming more and more difficult to, to do that over time. Um, uh, going back to the two and four mil uh, in that rural health district and in the um, <clears throat> medical district, those are set up differently. One of them is at two plus two and the other one is at three plus three. Um, I, uh, I tend to agree with Senator Case. I think two is is a pretty decent number. Uh, it would certainly with our our mill rate at approximately eight hundred fifty thousand dollars per mill. Uh, that would that would subsidize this real well. And then we're continuing with our own cost cutting uh, measures. We have also spent a fair bit of time talking with our local municipalities. We have an association of governments. We've spent close to two years trying to come up with some sort of solution. And this is an option. It wasn't perfect and it wasn't completely. Uh, everybody's, uh, you know, it wouldn't, everybody wasn't completely happy with it. However, we still consider it uh, an option to pursue as with other options that we would have for raising funds for this. So, and I'll stand for questions or, or maybe Commissioner Allen could pick up. Okay. Commissioner Allen, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and let us know what you have in the comments. Well, uh, I'm Larry Allen. I'm uh, of course, commissioner from Fremont County. Um, you know, our difficulty is kind of, is exactly like Commissioner Jones said. We had we had operated the ambulance as an enterprise fund, and we were doing the collections and and uh, the accounts receivable and and all that through the county uh, offices. Um, where we where we run into trouble is we have so much Medicare, Medicaid, IHS, and uh, just folks that just cannot pay. Um, so we privatized, it was our decision to privatize after, uh, the current, op, uh, director had asked us to, 
uh, infuse another three and a half million on top of the three million that we were going that we had already that we have been funding in the past, um, and then we chose to privatize and uh, we went with with one group that ultimately it ended up where they pretty much they were actually paying us to provide the service. Although we own all the assets, we own all the ambulances, all the ambulance barns, uh, the garages, the houses, all, all that, all, all that that goes with the ambulance. So, um, what what it ended up being was that that group of folks were there to promote the the air services, the fixed wing and the rotor services, and our usage from that went to where I believe we're the highest usage of air air assets in the in the state um and and so we need to we need to reduce that number dramatically for our citizens because if you know of anyone or you have used the air services yourself you know you're gonna get hit with a pretty substantial bill that you probably can't afford to pay um what we were talking uh, about the board members uh, you know, currently we have a 1% funding for that we passed for uh, road uh, infrastructure improvement. And we also have a new half cent economic sales tax that we have a, a, a group, a, a committee that meets on, on that. And what we've done, and it seems to work pretty well, is we take applications. We, If you don't know, we have five districts in, in Fremont County. So we take at least, we try to get two applicants from each district and we're, we're, not, we're not very successful getting two, usually from, from all the districts. So um, that way they represent the entire county and it, it's been working very well. We've, had, we've not had any hiccups. We've not had any uh, questioning from, from the citizens on, on the usage. Um, and getting to the, the four mills, I believe uh, Commissioner Jones and, uh, and the good Senator Kale Case is, is correct. Four is, is uh, I think, a lot. There might be some years where we have to do equipment upgrades, you know, ambulances. You know, an ambulance is a, is a quarter of a million dollars now, and it's a two-year wait to get one. So... Um, as big as this county is, we put on a lot of miles. We got uh, five new ones in 2019, and they've already got over 200,000 miles on them. So, um, you know, there might be some years where we may we may have to ask for an additional mill levy. But two mill levies would would currently serve our purposes, and we could apply for grants and so on and so forth to help cost share the ambulances. So. Um, it's uh, one of the things we've talked about earlier. It's difficult to find providers. We had um, we had uh, the 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 group that we have now as uh, as our provider, and we pay them a, a substantial subsidy. Uh, the other one that looked at it was uh, Park County Regional Health, and uh, um, they finally called me prior to the, the deadline of submitting the, the uh, proposals. And they said that they couldn't, they couldn't do it for less than 2.2 million. So um, I'm glad they were upfront with us and, and we moved on from there. And um, it's just, it's just, a, it's, it's a tough deal that we, we have to deal with. You know, most counties are fortunate or not most, but some counties are fortunate where they, they run the ambulance from the hospital. The hospital uh, uh, does the ambulance service. Um, I know uh, there's quite a few counties that do that. Carbon County, for instance, does a split. They do volunteers and then uh, with, a, with a private provider, and then the hospital pays for 60% uh, of, a, of a different a different service as well. So um, it not every county will use the, this opportunity, but it's something that we that we desperately need. We can't continue to take it out of our general fund because um, 
shortly we won't have a general fund to provide ambulance service for, even though we're not required to do so. That, that's all I have. I'm, I'll stand for questions as well. Committee, questions for the commissioners? None? Representative Ottman, you had some questions earlier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, commissioners. It's good to see you. Um, I have a couple questions, and as you know, I've tried to attend your meetings when I can, and it's always very informative, and you're always very welcoming, but it's still, it's, it's a big topic, and um, I still have some gray areas in my mind. Um, so what I'm, what I'm hearing, and you can explain it to me, um, what I'm hearing is that this bill would allow the uh, commissions, the county commissions in the different, um, well, in the state, to develop a special district, and they then would put into place how many, who the um, board members are and, and all of those things. And then what I'm understanding is that if any, if it was one mill or two or three or four, that that would go before there would be a public meeting. After all this was established, there would be a public meeting and then it would go before the voters. And if that is correct, um, I would like to know which voters, all the voters in the county and municipalities or just the counties. And um, I would also like to know with um, how much has the county paid and with services and how much was covered by the different, um, whatever you wanna call it, um, COVID or, or whatever funds, ARPA funds that came in this year and how much was actually taken out of the general fund. So uh, thank you. Either one of you, Commissioner Jones. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so uh, Mr. Chairman, um, Representative Ottman, I think that this would allow the commissioners to form the district as they see. I, I'd have to go back and look at the detail of the bill, but I think we could do an entire county or we could do sections. I know in Fremont County, we would look at the entire county uh, because we provide um, ambulance service to the entire county. Um, as far as our, our current budget and the COVID funds, we use no COVID funds uh, to, to subsidize the ambulance. Those all came out of our general funds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Additional questions for the commissioners? Um, excuse me, I might, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, go ahead. I might add, uh, Commissioner Jones is, is right. Uh, with this bill, we can define the, define the boundaries. Um, I'll give you a quick example. Uh, Riverton, Wyoming monthly average use is, is over 600 calls a month. Uh, Lander is around 380 and the Wind River Reservation is is about 380. Um, Dubois, ironically, averages about six calls a month. And there, for us to provide ambulance service in Dubois alone costs us, costs us our subsidy is $700,000. Nearly half of what it costs the, re the, the rest of the entire county. Vice Chairman Knapp. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director, do you, do you envision this bill as a piece of the solution or the solution because, you know, it, it goes back to, I look at solid waste or even hospital coverage. Um, raising a mill in one county doesn't even begin to cover the coverage of a hospital. In, in Campbell County, we've been fortunate because we have a hospital district and they don't even use all that money for ambulance services. So we cover it through the Joint Powers Board with the fire department to provide roughly, I would say half the ambulance service. 
Um, and then we've just contracted with Crook and we've contracted with Johnson, I believe. So is this more of a statewide look or a regional look at how we, how we actually cover ambulance service or is this just one small piece that really kind of won't put a dent in the, in the bucket? Mr. Chairman, Representative Mr. Ryman. Knapp, I, I think ultimately this is one piece of the puzzle. I don't uh, come to you to profess that this is going to solve the issue in every county. It's going to take a variety of the tools that exist as well as this one uh, and continuing to re-examine this issue uh, and figure out how we can better align the fees with the care that's being provided and, and uh, a variety of other things. So, you know, the, as I understand it, the EMS task force or the focus group that the governor's office has established will continue to work on this to refine and bring you solutions. So pl please don't take it that this is the only uh, you know, silver bullet for this issue, it's not. Additional questions, committee? All right. Thank you. Thank you, county commissioners, for tuning in with us. Additional public testimony on this bill? Raise your hand if you intend to offer public testimony. Okay. I guess we'll go for as long as we go. It looks like this bill's probably going to get held over unless we can. You got, we got 10 minutes and we still need time to work the bill. So, oh, 2.30. Oh, yeah, I forgot we did get out of 12. You know what? I think we're going to have plenty of time. <laughs> All right. Whoever wants to come testify, come on up. Don't mind me. We have 40 minutes. Mr. Chairman, my name is Lanny Applegate, and uh, I'm just going to give you a little bit of my background. Uh, I used to ride ambulance for about 12 years in Fremont County uh, in the 70s and 80s, and then I was also a county commissioner in Fremont County for about eight years from from 98 to 2006, and I can test that uh, what you're hearing today is is very true. Uh, as much as anything, it becomes a staffing issue. Uh, I remember when I was a commissioner, it was not uncommon to write off several hundreds of thousands of dollars every year because of not unable to collect it for various reasons from different uh, organizations, entities. So uh, I fully understand there's a need for this. Uh, I support it. I'll give you a personal experience. Back in December of 22, uh, my daughter and Lander, uh, she slipped on some ice there in town and it, it was an hour and 10 minutes to get an ambulance there. They ended up having to get an ambulance out of Riverton and that was when it was 20, 25 below zero. And uh, just so happened there's a couple other ladies that came by, even the local police department didn't show up. Uh, there's a couple ladies that uh, assisted her to get her back in her car to get it in at least some warm air. And uh, so, was, again, I believe it's probably due to staffing issues. Uh, it, it, there's probably plenty of ambulances. I'm hoping that if this, if this bill goes through, uh, that uh, a good share of this, the mills collected would, would uh, go towards staffing. Uh, not just equipment. Uh, obviously, there's going to be some equipment needs, uh, but uh, they definitely need to get some staffing. Uh, like I say, I had a personal experience of that. So on and for your bill. I didn't stand for any questions. Questions for Mr. Applegate. Okay. Sir, go ahead and introduce yourself. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Don Morris. I'm a volunteer representative from AARP, their government relations team. We are in favor of this bill. We know they're not just seniors, but there are lots of citizens that are dealing with um, a decrease in ambulance service, and in some cases, no ambulance service. 
I used to be an EMT in the 1970s and work with the Ambulance Association and the EMS office. Back then, there were every, there were towns that did not have service. Uh, there were towns that had the local mechanic go out. And throughout the 70s and the 80s, we worked. And every town, uh, every county had at least one, two, three, depending on how big the county was, fully equipped and fully trained ambulance services. So it's hard right now to see the problems that have arisen. One basic part of this bill we liked is the fundamental principle of voting. At the most fundamental level, elected officials, the county commissioners, hearing testimony will decide whether or not they need an EMS district. And then if they need an EMS district, they will develop one. And if they need the money, they will then put it to the voters. The voters will decide whether this is a good idea or not. So ultimately, at the very basic district, the same voters that have elected you and brought you here to improve things for them are going to be voting on this. And so I think that's a really good idea. They can say no and they can say yes. And that's really it for me. I'm open to any questions. Mr. Morris, just so I'm understanding it clearly, I think modify what you said just slightly. I think that the county commissioners can create the district. Right. The electors don't approve the creation of the district. They only approve the mills. That's right. They so approve the mill levy. When there's an election uh, to say we want two mills or three mills or possibly four mills, it comes then before the voters in that district to decide, yes, this is a good thing, or no, this is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. They will decide. And it's just another tool to allow some of these districts to develop it. Right, okay. Representative Ottman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here today. Just a, a, a generality question, because you were talking about staffing. Um, do you think that in any way this can, um, the development of a district can bring people We've had through the state um, where state entities have been kind of in competition with private industry for wages, wage increases. Do you, to, to not go there with something like this, do you, how do you see that we're going to find more staff by making a district when we may not have enough staffing now? That's Thank a you. question I'm gonna leave to the okay. counties. Oh. Uh, to to um, answer that one because here I live in Cheyenne and we we do have a qualified ambulance service here so I'll turn this over to Mr. Applegate or county folks. Mr. Applegate you want to take a shot at it? Mr. Chairman I'm, I'm assuming that uh, it's no question across statewide volunteerism is 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 getting harder and harder to get and we've got some different things in the works uh, for recruitment and retention. But I suspect that uh, on the long haul, that these fees are probably gonna, these mill levies will have to probably uh, have some paid, start having some little bit more paid staff come on board in order to have consistency and reliability as much as anything. Oh, you're back in it too? Okay, thanks, Senator Case. We won't hold you up. Additional public testimony, Mr. Lindholm. Welcome, it's about time you testify. You've been sitting in this room several days. And I've... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my name is Tyler Lindholm. I'm uh, with Americans for Prosperity, the Wyoming chapter. Um, and I hate to break up a good kumbaya, Mr. Chairman, but we're not in favor of this legislation and I, for multiple different reasons. Um, I think first and foremost, uh, members, I would, I would ask you what is necessary and prudent when it comes to government funding. I would certainly expect something along the lines of life um, and being able to provide emergency services would be at the top of that. Um, but 
as we often see, and as a former member of this committee, um, we, we saw a lot of special districts move forward in the past to be able to try and figure out these different pieces. But this is honestly the first time um, as, as far as something in regards to emergency services, which should be funded and be, be the first funded. Um, so in that case, if it's not being funded and there is a shortfall, then we have to ask ourselves um, as, as Wyomingites, you know, what could possibly be the problem? And we just heard testimony from a county commissioner saying that two mills would probably do this. Fremont County currently taxes 10 out of their 12 mills. They currently have the capability under existing statute to be able to fill that gap and provide for those two mills. And so the, the difference there though, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee would be that those two mills would have to be enacted by those county commissioners versus turning that, that mill vote over to the people. Um, if it is important and it is prudent and it is necessary, surely and in this situation, when we're talking about um, emergency services, we would look towards uh, that two mills to be to be fixed. Um, furthermore, Mr. Chairman, um, what we've seen a lot of in the, this, this legislative session has to do with property tax relief. Uh, folks at home are feeling that bite of property tax relief due to an enormous amount of people moving into our beautiful state and purchasing um, their homes for quite a bit of money. Um, and that has driven the assessment of that, of that property. And now folks are telling you at home, um, your constituents are telling you that they can't afford their property taxes. And so this, uh, your body, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee has approved um, some property tax relief. And so I, I feel, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, that's why we're, that's why we're opposed to this legislation is not because we're opposed to EMS or we're opposed to ambulatory services, but what we, what, what we are opposed to is uh, not properly funding um, the emergency services with the existing bills that are currently available in the state of Wyoming. And that's, um, that's my testimony, Mr. Chairman. I'll stand for any questions. Committee questions for Mr. Lindholm. Getting off for free, Mr. Chairman. How are the, uh, do you know how the ambulances are handled in your county? Are they, are they private or? Mr. Chairman. Have a memorial Hospital. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, we have a joint powers board um, that uh, funds it uh, through our memorial hospital, um, also with our county and city assisting. Um, and Mr. Chairman, I do come from um, support of a uh, somebody that works in the medical field. My wife is a registered nurse who's a year out from her nurse practitioner degree. Um, so she's constantly dealing with emergency services, th those types of things. We do have a group of volunteers um, in, in Crook County that do um, hunker down on this aspect. Um, and there's also, I mean, there's different models throughout the state, as I'm sure you're aware, Mr. Chairman, the county directly to, this, to my south um, was recently um, a private um, service, and they've recently transitioned to um, a public model, uh, none of which required um, an additional special district. And I would, I, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned this before. Um, I, I, when we're talking about special districts, uh, there, there is a pretty good model already, um, already in Title 18 when it comes to hospital districts and being able, if, we, if, if, if an exemption is going to be put in place or some type of exception or bolt-on is going to be put onto a, a special district, I, I, I would argue it's probably more appropriate um, that that exception or that bolt-on happens to a hospital district or a memorial hospital district versus an improvement district. Improvement districts, Mr. Chairman, as I'm sure you know, were originally started as road districts um, for non-county roads that um, groups of people could get together and agree to plow snow together um, versus um, something emergency services like this. Questions for Mr. Lindholm? All right, thank you, Mr. Lindholm. I feel like you guys coordinated that. Mr. Chairman, Eric Bullith, Wyoming Hospital Association. I actually offered to walk up here holding hands, but he didn't want to do it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> committee members, I'm Eric Bully. I'm president of the Wyoming Hospital Association. I do not represent the EMS Association, but I work very closely with them. I also have been serving for the last two years on the governor's health care task force and on the subcommittee that has to do with EMS. I also serve on the governor's EMS council. 
and EMS services are at a crossroads right now in our state. It's it's pretty scary to see what's going on. We're seeing some success, and we've talked a little bit about some consolidation that's taken place in a couple of parts of the state. Uh, Representative Knapp up in your neck of the woods, Sheridan Memorial, along with Gillette, uh, Campbell County Health, have partnered and created a new organization, and they have now moved in and are covering Newcastle. I think they also provide some services in Moorcroft when there isn't enough service in that volunteer service. Um, they do not cover Hewlett. They don't cover Crook. We've also seen some stuff happening up in the Bighorn Basin. Cody Regional Health is partnered with a couple of the different hospitals, so they're providing services in uh, Worland and also over in Basin. Um, we definitely stand in support of this. I can answer some questions about hospital districts when we get there, but we support this because it's a, an arrow in the quiver. It's not going to solve all the problems. This is a huge, huge problem that's been a long time coming. We've talked about the fact that this is not considered, nor is it funded as an essential service. And as you can hear, it's, it's going to be a big bite at the apple if the county commissioners are required to do that through the county. But this does give an opportunity for the voters to decide whether or not they think it's an essential service in their communities in whatever district is formed to help give some funding. For those of you that don't know, my background, I was a hospital and nursing home administrator in Kemmer. I spent 20 years there. We, we operated three EMS services. They were all voluntary and we struggled. We had Cokeville and we had Labarge. Uh, Labarge we had to close down because there weren't enough volunteers. And when somebody called 911, we didn't know whether or not the service would show up, so they had to respond all the way from Kemmer, which is an hour one way. When we talk about life, when we talk about that golden hour when someone has a stroke, someone has a heart attack, they need people there quickly. We partnered with uh, Sublet County because they had a pretty robust, they had a lot of money at the time, and they had a pretty robust EMS service. They would respond to Labarge for us when, when they had the availability. Cokeville struggled for years and finally, um, you know, they're close to, to shutting down too. So that whole area right now is covered by one service out of the hospital. And they, they have a few paid uh, staff members, but the rest of it's still voluntary. And we're seeing a drop in how many volunteers there are in all these services because the training is extensive. It takes a lot of training and we're actually moving to a higher level of training to make sure that we've got the right people responding to these calls. We've seen some consolidation happen in the Star Valley area. There were three different services in, in North Lincoln County that operated independently. They finally have all come underneath the hospital umbrella, which makes a lot of sense when we talk about how they're reimbursed. If you have a uh, an EMS service that is a f run by a hospital, the reimbursement is much higher than if they're standalone. And so that's a good thing, especially if it's a critical access hospital. This bill does not mandate that this happens. This bill gives the opportunity for those communities to consider whether or not this should happen. Uh, Senator Case isn't here, but there have been a couple of other districts, and I think the reason we that it landed at four, I didn't know the bill was coming until it came out, but we uh, created senior health care districts a couple of years ago, and it, it had a, a maximum of four. It's two mills to start off with if the electors decide they want to have it, and then they can elect to have two more mills Rural health care clinic, rural health clinics also have up to four mills. Hospital districts are a little different. We have 18 hospital districts in the state. They actually, when they form, they get three mills, and then they can go to the voters for up to an additional three mills. And that goes back to the voters every two years. Um, let's see. A lot of this has to do with volume. And as we... I can I ask a question on sure. that? that? That is something I... I was curious about, and it sounds like it seems like the formation of these other districts, like the senior district, to answer my question. The the way this bill's designed, the co county commissioners could say create an EMS district, and then and then once they put the mill, they choose two mills, um, and they put it, to, or let's say they go with three mills or whatever, it doesn't matter. They put it to the voters, and the voters say no. They have a district that's not funded. But under those other two models you just referenced, they start with an automatic upon creation. They start so the senior district is created um, with two mills upon creation. Is it created by the county commissioners, or is that created by the by the electors in the district? Mr. Chairman, I think that's a great question. If, if my recollection is correct, it, the voters decide whether or not that district should okay. be created. And I think statutorily, they they automatically start with two, and then they can 
have the electors decide for an additional two, so it goes up to four. Okay. This is this is very different. So maybe that's the difference is that the electors are creating are agreeing to the two mills in the beginning by its creation, yep. as opposed to here. I get it. Okay. Yep. Go ahead. Um, let's see. Uh, there was a question about ARPA funding. I think it came from you, Representative Ottman. So there, to my knowledge, there's been no ARPA funding that's been given to EMS, except the governor did allocate $5 million that we actually administered through our, through our hospital association to go out and stabilize the existing EMS staffing. Um, and we just completed that program at the end of the year. As far as actually helping EMS services, um, there was a grant and it's gone through the Department of Health. They are looking at doing some pilot programs I think they're going to support uh, seven or eight of the different ideas that are going on. There may be some going up in your neck of the woods. I think there's some going to Bighorn Basin. Um, but you've also heard testimony. It's expensive. A new ambulance right now is more than a quarter of a million. It's almost $350,000. And we used to be able to get matching funds out of the SLIB, but that funding has gone away. And so it, we've got aging equipment. We've got huge geographical areas that need that need uh, support and need these services and so we just think this is a great opportunity for voters to decide whether or not they want these services and if they're willing to pay for them and with that we stand in, in support of this and i'd answer any questions that you have for me questions committee representative yin mr chairman maybe this is something i should have asked mr reman um, Mr. Bully, do you know if any improvement service districts already exist that provide EMS services? Mr. Chairman, Representative Yin, I have very little knowledge, but I'm not aware of any that actually support EMS. Additional questions, Representative Ottman? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Bully. A couple questions, but the first one is as far as the hospitals go, which hospitals here in the state, if any, uh, provide ambulance service? And um, is it just in municipalities if they do so? And did they used to support um, service in the counties? And if so, when did that stop? Mr. Chairman, Representative Ottman. So um, off the top of my head, I don't know. I think there's 20 services that are operated or affiliated with hospitals at this point. There, there are close to 40, I believe, and I know the EMS uh, folks are here from the state. I think there are close to 40 EMS services. Some of them are private, some of them are joint powers board, some of them, I don't even know how they're funded and how they stay open. Um, as far as their, their um, service areas, it, it's not specifically defined. I mean. It, when a when a call goes out and there's there's need um, any services that are close to those areas may respond and a lot of it has to do with whether or not the one ambulance in that community is already out on another call or whether it's on a transfer to Salt Lake City or to Billings or Denver um, it's I don't think it's clearly defined I think that there's uh, mutual aid agreements that cross county lines and so EMS services can help out wherever is needed in the state. Representative Ottman. Okay, Mr. Bully, as we're looking at um, the limited population in Wyoming and, and different things and the vastness and um, small communities and things like that, um, one of the things that I've noticed is ambulances have really come a long way. I mean, they're basically, from what I've seen, uh, little triage units. And so I'm looking at when we have smaller communities, I'm not saying I wouldn't want the utmost, I guess I've heard it said Cadillac ambulance coming to serve me. Um, is, it, is it reality that, especially at this time when um, we're hurting as a state, is it the time to Put these things in because I believe that there's requirements have you as you've referenced a few times there's regulations on uh, how much training volunteers need and what kind of service and what kind of vehicles and um, the companies they went from I think I heard eight hundred thousand dollars to service our county uh, barely a year and a half ago to 1.3 million now so is this the time 
to jump on board with something like this or do we need to wait until some of these things flush out and people start appearing again to um, to provide these services, but also to be taxpayers? Mr. Bell. Mr. Chairman, Representative Altman, I think it's past time to do something like this. I think we're too late, and I think this has been a long time coming. Um, I, I think some of the things to consider here, and um, it, it is expensive, but we've actually seen a shrinkage. So the free markets, if that's what we're talking about, it's not working. There's no money to be made for most of these services. Most of them have to be subsidized to be operational. And so this, is, this, this helps out. The thing to consider is in a lot of these small communities, and I'm talking about experience, we'd, we'd get calls daily where people would call in and they needed to be transferred from the toilet to their bed. There was, there was no bill that would go out. Our EMS services would, would go there. There are a ton of these calls where there's no payment at all. There's not a lot of money to be made, if any. In the areas that there is money to be made, you're seeing that with these big services, these private services that are serving these communities. But even those are fragile. Um, and so I, I actually think that this, this and other ideas that we've been kicking around, we should have been doing a long time ago to come up with funding models at work. Representative. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Bully, we've gone round and round for a couple years about this. If, if the funding isn't there, if the people are um, not paying their fair share, what do you think you can, we can accomplish by taxing people more on property? It seems as though, and correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of the services that are being used that are unpaid are not property owners. Um, so that is one thing. And secondly, um, why do the hospitals not provide this service? You know how to do it. The hospitals know how to do it. You know what is more expedient. Uh, you have the, the care centers right there. You have the professionals to do the triage. You have usually the helicopter pads if there's going to be one. Uh, and the uh, opportunity to have on site the facilities for the ambulances. So why is this service not part of the hospitals? Mr. Chairman, Representative Altman, we have gone around and around on this, and, and it's been an interesting conversation. So there are a lot of hospitals that do this, but there are services that aren't owned or operated by the hospitals. We've got services that come in from out of state. Um, we've got some in certain rural communities where there isn't a hospital, and those, those are the ones that we're really dealing with here in a, in a lot of situations. But even those that are attached to hospitals with better reimbursement because they're hospital-based, they still have to be subsidized. That's just that's just the nature of the beast. They're, this is not a money-making proposition. Free market doesn't work except in the markets where it works. I, I look at the people that are traveling I-80. I look at the folks that go to Yellowstone. If they get in an accident, they expect to have emergency services. There's got to be some way to pay for this. I, I don't disagree with you that property tax isn't always a solution, but if a community wants these services, expects these, these services, you got to find a way to pay for it. And to give, give care away without compensation or making sure that these services are viable, we're just going to continue to see shrinkage of the market, and we're going to have more problems across the state as opposed to fixing the problem. Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Vice Chairman, go ahead. So do you, I'm just curious because you are involved so much on, on every aspect of the medical industry, which to me is this ever growing out of control monster, but part of it's because of our own expectations of what medic, medicine can offer today. What's available now in, in, in treatment is incredible compared to what it was even 10 years ago. Um, so that involves money whether it's a $6 million uh, new CRT or, um, or ambulance services, like you said, $300,000 ambulances. So for our, our hospital, for instance, we do the three mills and that, that in Campbell County, that's quite a bit of money. Almost 100% of that goes to bad debt in, par in partial uh, aspect to Medicare and Medicaid. Um, I worry about the taxpayer. Um, instead of one big bite, I think we're nibbling the taxpayer like piranhas in in these smaller taxes that we that we place on them. 
um, and it's for for a result, but because it's going to involve um, employees, you know, it's not just about getting ambulances and, and having those available because it involves employees. And because I don't think the volunteer system is as robust as it was maybe in the fire services. Um, do you see this just causing even more of an effect of needing even more funding to provide that level of expectation that people have to have adequate staffing and to have an ambulance available? Mr. Bowling. Mr. Chairman, Representative Knapp, I think it's a great question. And, and in all honesty, there's not enough funding now. Um, and it, as we see volunteers leave and we need to bring on paid staff, it's only going to exacerbate the problem. So I agree with you. We are nibbling around the edges. This, this is going to require a lot of money to fix this problem. And expectations have changed a lot. What, what's considered uh, normal care now, when I started in the industry 30 years ago, we, we didn't have a CT in every facility. We didn't have MRI in every facility. Um, but that is what's expected, and that's, that's the standard of care now. In, in EMS services, we're, we're seeing a, a higher level of training because they're dealing with some really complex cases, and, and the volunteer model really didn't work because the training wasn't there. So I don't disagree with you, but, but again, this, all this does is give the communities the opportunity to decide whether or not they want to enact this, and then the voters can decide. And, and I just think it's one tool or one arrow that we can help to, to solve a much bigger and broader problem and I know from the, the healthcare task force, we're committed to continue to look at more solutions. We were instrumental a couple of years ago in passing a, an upper payment limit program to help the EMS services too, which brings in additional federal funding, doesn't cost the state anything. Um, we're in the process of standing that one up. We, we've been looking at, at opportunities and other options for years. And this is, just, this is just the beginning, honestly. We've got a long ways to go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think I said CRT machine, which is a, a whole different monster. Um, so I, I knew what you meant. Representative. <laughs> that. That's a different committee. All right, thank you, Mr. Bowie. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Hill? there are three people online too, with their hands raised. Oh, additional? Okay. We'll, uh, I guess we'll take another five minutes of testimony. Is it who, anyone else in the room wishing to testify on this bill? Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Obermuller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Pete Obermuller, Patrolman Association of Wyoming. I can tell by your faces that you're all so excited about this. So I'll um, uh, just want to, to give you our, um, our assessment about special districts writ large. But before I do that, I just want to make sure that the committee knows that we do not oppose this bill. I'm not asking you to vote no on this bill. Uh, the issue that we have and largely have with special districts is the same issue we have with taxation, particularly property taxation writ large in the state of Wyoming. Special districts adding four mills is essentially asking the minerals industry to, to pay for it all. Now, EMS service is important and necessary. We must have it in every community and every county. And we need the EMS services to come out to the rural areas of the county in order to help us and our people when we need it. So that, that's why we're, we're not necessarily opposed to the bill. But it's important for us for a committee like this, uh, particularly with new members uh, uh, that haven't dealt with special districts. We had a task force that I uh, spent a lot of time on with Senator Case back uh, a few years ago that in fact um, he mentioned or somebody mentioned, the, uh, Mr. Riemann mentioned the line item veto for county commissioners. When I was with the county commissioners, I fought pretty hard for that specific line. And it was a hard fight to get it so that commissioners had the ability to even do that line item. So I, I completely agree with that and have a soft spot for counties. But Mr. Chairman, the, the, the talk about uh, sending a special district that, it's, that it's, um, it's better because it goes to the voters, I agree. But the only two, uh, you know, Representative Haroldson's county and, and constituents and Representative Yin's county and constituents, if they're asked to vote on this, they're actually voting on whether they're gonna tax themselves. Every other county represented on this committee, if it goes to the voters, you're asking the voters to tax somebody else to do this. 83% uh, of the total property tax yield in Fremont County is paid for by minerals. Uh, 70, it's something like 79%. And well, in fact, let me find it. I'm not even gonna guess. Um, 
very quickly. 87% of the total tax yield in Sweetwater County is paid for by minerals. So when you add four mills, pretty much you know 3.3 to 3.4 of those mills will be paid by minerals, not by the homeowners or in, in the cities that need it. And we just, we, as Mr. Boley mentioned, there's a lot to EMS service in Wyoming that needs attention. It's a structural issue. Um, a lot of fire districts exists in, in the state of Wyoming. And if your home is on fire and the fire district comes out, you don't also get a bill for that. And they don't determine whether it's medical, ne medically necessary. And you get a, an additional bill for that. So th there's structural problems here. And, uh, and um, we're perfectly willing to subsidize this. Why we're not opposed to the bill. I want to just reiterate that again. It's just, a, it's just a bigger issue for us that we want the committee to, to have eyes wide open on when you're moving forward with it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Questions for Mr. Obermuller? Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> Mr. Obi Mueller, um, so you, I understand what you're saying in taxing the mineral industry, and we had a pretty large supplemental budget this session. Would you say that um, it's a matter of real allocation of priorities when it comes to um, what is essential services in Wyoming and, and what is not? Mr. Obi Mueller? Mr. Chairman, I think that's accurate, and, and I think I think EMS services is essential. Uh, we don't we don't have that structure, and we don't have a tax code that allows the counties to subsume this underneath their twelve mil cap. Let's say that we did, minerals would still be subsidizing it. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't. At, at this point, it doesn't matter one way or the other. Minerals will subsidize it, and that's okay. That, that that's okay for this particular district. Uh, it it's. Uh, it is a matter of, it's a policy decision at the end of the day. You know, we have 700 special districts, 700 plus special districts in the state currently. All right. Thank you, Mr. Obermuller. Let's go ahead and let our three folks in. You said there's three? Okay. All right, welcome. Just so you know, we only have uh, five minutes remaining, so I'm going to have to limit you each to a minute. If you could just kind of watch the clock and tell us what we need to know and try not to be repetitive, just knowing that we're in a time crunch. Whoever wants to go first, go ahead. Yep. Luke, your, your, your mic's lit up, so go ahead. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. My name is Luke Seifert. I'm the president of the Wyoming EMS Association. Um, and I'll be real short here. We're in support of this bill. Very grateful for the hospital association and uh, answering many of your questions. Um, I just want to add that a lot of this has to do with um, reimbursement for Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, this is not based on percentage. It's based on a fixed rate. And so we have a large deficit uh, that's incurred when we respond to uh, calls involving usually involving Medicare and Medicaid recipients, also the VA, um, those government provided health insurance programs uh, le uh, leave a lot on the table for for us to pick up. Also, as Mr. Uh, Bully mentioned, the calls where we respond to do not transport a patient, we're not receiving reimbursement for. Um, I'd also add on top of the cost of employment, there's also a lot of infrastructure needs that has been uh, vocalized throughout the state for stations and and other things like that that are very expensive. And so um, with that, I, uh, I'll stand for any questions. Questions? All right. Well, thank you for your testimony. Mr. Thank Quinney, you. you're next. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Eric Quinney, uh, Director of Uinta County Ambulance. Um, I appreciate uh, Eric Bowley and, and Luke uh, talking. 2,100 calls in Uinta County this last year. 800 of those non-billable. Um, there's not enough money to uh, to sustain our operations long term. We subsidize our operations with volunteers, and uh, if something doesn't happen, something doesn't get fixed, we're going to have to close our doors. Um, we can't we can't continue to operate with the federal reimbursements from Medicare and Medicaid. Um, we continue to go on I-80 all day long, wreck to wreck. 
checking on patients. And if we don't transport anybody, we don't get paid. Um, lift assist, middle of the night, helping people. Um, everybody wants us to come, but um, we don't get are able to bill for many of the services that we provide. And, and if we don't have any type of funding um, secured up, we're going to have to close our doors as other ambulance services have closed their doors um, recently across the state. So we need help. Thank you. In support of the bill. Questions for Mr. Quinney. All right. Thank you for your testimony. Ms. Fries. Uh, Julie Fries, Fremont County Clerk. Sorry, camera's still broken. Um, I just wanted to, to remark on our 10 mills in Fremont County. Um, we had a lot of ARPA money coming through here, and we're very careful with our tax dollars. That is not going to be the way it is. We haven't had that for years. We were super lucky not to tax our people. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, there is no election. I'm trying to clarify some of the questions I've heard. There is no election. Um, you can set up the district the way this is set up. You can set up a district, gets more minds going about what we need to do in each county or however you set that up. You get those two mills to start with, and then the election happens. You figure out what your district lines are, and then you could ask for two more mills. I think I've heard our county commissioners say we can probably handle it with two mills. Um, what we're looking for, or why we can't find um, some of our personnel, why we can't, can't we keep them here? We can't pay them. We can't pay them for the level of service that right now our county thinks they deserve, which I'm not saying is wrong, uh, but there's a level of service. And if we don't have some relief somewhere because we can't keep paying $2 million and up for our ambulance service, it will be a determination of level of service. That's what we discussed in our, in our hearings here. Uh, we don't have a hospital district in Fremont County, so we wouldn't be able to uh, work through the hospital district. And I think there was a discussion, maybe rural health care districts or the hospital district as a way to do that. The rural health care district, it allows any kind of medical, the hospitals or medicals to also come in and take those funds. And right now we're looking at a way, we've looked at all of all the ways. We've had many meetings here in Fremont County. The, this was just one way that we can handle it ourselves. And, and if that's what our people want in our county or whatever other county, then, then that's a way to do it. So if I can answer any other questions. Questions for Ms. Fries. Representative Ottman. I'll make it quick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Fries, hi. Hi. Thanks for coming. You're always... Um, so informative with your experience. Did you say that the district, um, that the commissioners would vote to uh, make a district and then two mills would be uh, applied to that and then uh, it would continue on from there? You, It was pretty fast. I, I found myself thinking and uh, I missed some of that. So could you repeat that, please? Sure, Mr. Chairman, um, Representative Ottman. So the way, because it is kind of confusing the way this is written, because I was confused for a while as well. So this can be set up like a solid waste district. That's if that helps anybody. So the commissioners decide who's on there on the committee, and it looks like you get two mills. And then if you want more than two mills, you have to go out to your electors to say you want more than two mills. So it's set up like um, a solid waste, if you would that they, they set, they're set up with three mills automatic, and then the commissioners decide who sets on that board, and they are the elected officials that are accountable to the public, if that helps. Additional questions for Ms. Fries? All right, thank you, Ms. Fries. Thank you. I almost forgot about you. It's not always a bad thing. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know we're out of time. I'll be very, very brief. David Fraser, Executive Director, Wyoming Association of Municipalities. Three quick points. Number one, this is a big issue, and it's not just a big, there are, uh, the areas that have robust service presently are the exception, not the rule. I'm in close communication with a local of elected officials all over the state, and this is a big issue uh, that needs to be addressed, and not just in the smallest, including the smallest, cities, but not just in the smallest cities. I appreciate Fremont uh, County taking the lead on this, but it is a statewide issue. Uh, second point of three is that uh, if you do pass this, you're not, in fact, taxing anybody. All you're doing is allowing uh, the voters in a, local in a local jurisdiction to decide whether they want to pay 
uh, for this service. Uh, so what you, all you're doing is enabling a local decision on whether that's worth paying for a bit, you know, for the service. Uh, and, uh, and thirdly, uh, it's been indicated that this isn't the perfect solution. Uh, it's also been indicated it's not the total solution. Uh, but to my knowledge, it's the only solution on the table in the, two, in the 2023 legislature. And I think it's imperative uh, that you begin to uh, take a bite out of this problem, that, we can, that you begin to make some positive uh, impact on rural uh, EMS. So I would encourage you, yes, vote not because this is perfect, but because it's good and, and it's what you have in front of you. I'd take any questions. Questions for Director Fraser, Representative Ottman. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Fraser, did um, thank you for being here. Did I misunderstand? Once there's the creation of the district and two mills are given, then later, if there's two more mills want, desired or needed, then it goes to the electorate. Is that's what I thought I heard, but that's not what I heard you just say. No, that's not accurate. That's no. that was the senior districts how they're designed. This is created Which by district? the senior districts. Once the county commissioners create an EMS district, there are no mills. There's zero. Start with zero as the base, and then whatever they propose, the electors have to approve. So, what did? Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Are you talking about Mr. Bowley's testimony? No, Miss Freeze. Oh, I'm not sure what she's talking about, but. There are other districts that operate with automatic mills when they're created. Well, she had said with the um, the solid waste district received three mills, and she said the this district would receive two. No, it's on page uh, page what is it? Page through six. Yeah, page six lines fourteen through eighteen. Any other questions, committee? All right, thank you, Mr. Frazier. Any other public testimony? I will close public testimony. Committee, what is your pleasure? Move the bill. Second. Moved by Representative Chadwick and seconded by Representative Wiley. Any amendments to this bill on page one, page two, page three? Page four, page five, page six, page seven. Oh, discussion. Mr. Chairman, if I could just make a comment. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to. Your mic's not on. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'd just like everybody to know, um, being from one of the larger communities, larger counties in the state, Sweetwater's been struggling with this for the last few years. And uh, I, I want to I want to take a minute to go back to that that golden hour. We heard it we heard it a couple of times. Um, if if you have to go from Farson to Wamsutter to uh, Bear Oil, out to the folks in Granger, we have one one hospital district, and that's inside City of Rock Springs. They don't have the infrastructure to handle these ambulance services or anything. We tried to privatize. We had two service providers. Last handful of years become strained on the system. Now we're down to one. So I, I think I think this is a good tool for our county to be able to opt in or out on, let the folks decide to be able to keep these services. And at the whole time that this is all going on, we have I-80 running through running through the middle of us from east to west, west to east. Anyway, I'm I'm in support of this. Representative Ottman, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And while I am 100% um, supportive um, in the idea that EMS services are so very um, helpful, it's still, um, I'm not going to be able to support this because on page 5, lines 8 through 15, do say, about the uh, commissioners shall appoint not less than three nor more than nine or oh, that's residents but um anyway it's on there at the bottom let me see i just had it anyway there are mills that they're going to um put in there before it is voted on um well i'll re i'll read and reread the bill the and, and go so no page, page five page five yeah 
view on the blue version? That that's that section you were just reading from is the creation of the board. Right. And then okay, the go is, down. So B, subsection B. Mm hmm Yeah, so it's the bottom, it's the end of section B where it says if the district was formed under 1812-105B as a district to provide EMS services, the tax for the district shall not exceed four mills if the mill, if the mills are approved by the board of directors and then approved by the electors. So it can it could be one anywhere from one to four mills, but the electors have to approve it. It it can't have it can't have a mill without the electors approving it, is the way I read that. And the okay. way the testimony has been presented on it. Okay. Well, I I will continue to um, to look into this and talk to people because I I just had a message again and said yes they can. So um, it's a big bill. It's got a lot of uh, important things in there, and um, so my I'm afraid my vote for right now will be no. Thank you. Okay. Barb, will you please do a roll call vote on Senate File 43 EMS Districts? Representative Chadwick. Aye. Representative Haroldson. No. Representative Harshman. Vice Chairman Knapp. No. Representative Newsom. Representative Ottman. No. Representative Wiley. Aye. Representative Yin. Aye. Chairman Olson. No. Five aye, four no. We are adjourned. What's that?